Good morning and welcome to the first uh, Barbara Hertzberg Annual Women's Health Lecture. This uh, lectureship was recently established by our department to honor Dr. Barbara Hertzberg, whose career at Duke has spanned more than 30 years. As most of you know, her academic career has been in the field of ultrasound with a special interest in OBGYN imaging. Her undergraduate education started at Cornell University, followed by her medical education at Duke University School of Medicine, where she continued her training in radiology at Duke, followed by a one-year fellowship in ultrasound and CT at Thomas Jefferson. She then returned to Duke as faculty in the ultrasound section. Her academic career has been highly successful with much more, uh, much more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and abstracts and more than 40 book chapters and reviews. She has been an editor of two books, most notably the requisite series on ultrasound, third edition, which many of us have used to study for our oral boards. Speaking of oral boards, Dr. Hertzberg was an examiner for many years of the oral boards when it was uh, when uh, many of us uh, went through that process. Dr. Hertzberg has particularly distinguished herself as a teacher in our department, where she has been awarded five individual teaching awards, which is probably more than anyone else in the department. I particularly remember when I was a resident, how she would take the time to teach and explain cases and answer questions, even when it was extremely busy in the reading room. And these efforts I know were very much appreciated by all of the residents. Now, in addition to our faculty appointment in the Department of Radiology, Dr. Hertzberg also had a secondary appointment as Associate Professor of OBGYN. She has also served as co-director of the Fetal Diagnostic Center along with Dr. Brita Boyd in maternal fetal medicine. So in the last year, she's enjoyed her retirement. I'm sure um, taking some time off to enjoy it with her family. And um, we are you know, very proud to um, honor her with this annual lectureship. Thank you. Thanks, Ujada. Perfect. Perfect. Um, all right. Now we're, um, if, if Russell Thompson could intro uh, formally introduce our, our speaker, Dr. Swami. Good morning, everybody. My name is Russell Thompson. I'm one of the R1 residents. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Swami this morning. She got her BS in public health and biostatistics from UNC and then stayed on at UNC for her medical degree. She went, then went uh, up north to Pittsburgh, did her ob residency there. And then we were lucky enough to have her come back down here to join us at Duke for her MFM fellowship. So maternal fetal medicine, high-risk pregnancies. She got uh, involved in research starting from when she was a resident and has continued that interest. She focuses primarily on perinatal infection, preterm birth, and immunizations during pregnancies and has been heavily involved in the Human Vaccine Institute here at Duke. She has over 40 grants and over 100 publications. She's also been involved in the IRB starting early in her career here and has, has now advanced to the, be the Associate Vice President for Research and the Vice Dean for Scientific Integrity here at Duke. Um, finally, she's been mentor to a number of trainees and young faculty members throughout her career. And her talk today is entitled Women in Academic Health, The Past, Present, and the Path Forward. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Swami. Thank you, Russell. Thanks very much, everybody. And uh, thanks so much um, uh, for inviting me. And Barbara, it's so good to see you on the screen. I haven't seen you in a long time. And um, it's, uh, it's, I, I'm sure this is very um, impressive and emotional for you. And I can tell you that as I put things together for a talk, I felt the same way, thinking about my career and all the people who have been, um, who I've been fortunate to be blessed to get to work with. And I think of you very fondly in that way too. So it's very, I feel very privileged to be able to give this talk today. So thank you all. So um, I'm going to, let's see if I can share my screen now. And let's see if I can get that right. Uh, I seem to be having trouble lately with all the Zoom features. Can you all see that as a, at least a title slide there? Yes, we see it. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, thanks very much. Okay, so um, I promise this is not going to be a doom and gloom kind of uh, talk, but I am gonna go through a little bit of kind of where we have been and, uh, and where we are now. 
um, to try to set the stage for what we should think for as we go forward in the future. Um, so I want to just be mindful of acknowledgments that there are as uh, much content here that I have um, borrowed and um, uh, for others that I know in the space of women's uh, academic development here for uh, information that they put out in other slides. So it's really important, I think, to think, you know, beyond ourselves, where we are today um, at Duke University and what we do, but how are we influenced by society? This is obviously a time of incredible societal and cultural change. And so I want to be mindful and say that what I'm talking about today um, with regards to women in academic medicine um, really can be translated to uh, what I think of as any individuals who have been historically underrepresented, um, excluded, or uh, really not put forward um, in the way to advancement. Um, although my personal expertise is, uh, is in this area of women in academic medicine. So that is obviously what I'm going to focus on today. So we really want to think about what do women leaders look like? Um, how are women leaders supposedly um, uh, behaving? Um, meaning, is there a path that they have an expectation to behave differently in that role? Um, what is the impact of their ability of women to achieve leadership roles? And how does this affect um, your desires or decisions to hire and promote women along the way? So it's important to know that this is a conversation that's been going on for a while. Um, here are some publications from about five, six years ago, uh, specifically for a special issue from Academic Medicine, um, which is sponsored by AAMC. And thinking about uh, looking back to the last 25, 30 years, um, how do we develop a framework to establish gender equity? So I want to give a shout out to folks in your department, to Lars Grimm um, and others for really thinking about this over the last few years, specifically in, uh, in academic radiology and how we're thinking about gender and racial bias in those areas um, and how we need to think about uh, uh, starting from the beginning, even from uh, residency training and in recommendations and how to think about this as we go forward in the pipeline development. So what are the problems though? Um, and this is, very, I wanna make a real point here that this is not a unique issue in academic medicine, although female professors are woefully outnumbered in medical schools nationwide, um, but it's really a problem across the board in, um, in business, um, in all kinds of areas of leadership. So what do we know specifically though in academic medicine? So this was just a publication from last fall um, that looked at uh, medical school graduates and the path to promotion and looked at the data by sort of two cohorts. Um, I will point out I'm on the I'm right on the edge of the of the early cohort and the move to the late cohort. So it's interesting to think about that uh, that sort of division there. But they looked at the percent of women expected to be promoted um, based on the proportion of women who were actually promoted and adjusted for different things. And it was very clear that women as assistant professors were less likely to be promoted to associate professor than men. Um, it's the same to advance then from professor to even department chairs and other positions above that. Um, again, I'm not going to focus all on negative, so I just want to set the stage here, but to then look at um, the numbers of uh, faculty uh, by both gender and race, you can see that there has been change um, over the years. It's slow, um, but we do see that that's pretty flat, though, um, when we then break down, that down by uh, non-white groups. Uh, similarly, you see that, um, excuse me, so, so the previous slide here was for uh, women faculty or female faculty, and now you can see that this is for male faculty. And so I think, you know, one of the things that's an issue is that the denominator itself is not necessarily dramatically increasing, right? We're not adding more and more medical schools. We're not adding, uh, increasing our numbers of faculty. So it really becomes about balancing um, that number uh, within. So then what do we know though about as we move forward? Um, this is data that is followed by AAMC about uh, medical school deans. And so the, the interesting thing about Duke is that we are a fairly unique in that the majority of our deans across the institution are women. Um, I think we have, I always forget the number, we have either 11 or 13 schools and uh, nearly all of them except two are uh, led by female deans. Um, and you can see here that the number of women deans um, has been increasing. Um, but again, that is compared to the number of men uh, as deans decreasing. 
And so it always becomes this question, are we, is it a trade-off? Are we just substituting one and the other? Are we diminishing opportunities for other people? Um, and you, so you may have seen things in the literature to talk about things like term limits of department chairs and dean positions, um, even president positions type of things. Um, you know, I think that uh, the job and, uh, and Eric and any others who are on, on as uh, chairs you know, many people will talk about how those leadership jobs, it's sort of a 10 year cycle and it's really tough to kind of continue to be motivated and move that forward. Um, but on the other hand, there are many individuals we all know who have been department chairs for 15, 20, 25 years. Um, so at some point the balance will, will tip. But let's talk a little bit more about then other numbers, right? And so we know that there has been a lot of focus on the uh, gender equity in pay. And so one of the issues to look there, again, from the standpoint of not only at training, when we talk about who we're accepting to residency programs, fellowships, and so forth, who we're recruiting, but also where we're starting out in pay. And so it's interesting to note that even the starting gate pay gap exists somewhere around $16,000 or $17,000 between men and, and women. Um, that uh, pay gap was analyzed through a, a survey that Doximity ran last year, and they identified about a 28% uh, pay gap. That's a little over $100,000. There was no specialty in which women earned more than men, and women earned less in nearly all the top 50 metropolitan areas. Um, so that one number, right, when you think about it at the start of the of, um, following training and first jobs, and then look at the pay gap across, um, what does that mean over a lifetime? Um, and so if you look at that and think there may be this wealth gap um, over time and then think of the interest, you can see that over a, say, 50-year period, that that's a pretty significant change in the overall um, accomplishment of pay. So we also know, though, that this is, uh, again, as I mentioned, not just a um, male-female issue, but also other underrepresented groups as far as race, ethnicity, and so forth. You can see here um, that it's actually even worse um, if you look uh, compared to white women and black women. So what do women say that they need to succeed, right? So if we know that these issues exist, how do we move that forward? And I wanna be clear, I'm gonna I'm focusing here on what um, the faculty engagement survey from AAMC said with women's responses. But to be clear, this is not an issue that can be led only by women or should be led only by women. Because the data would show you that uh, in, in institutions and in industry and in companies where there is uh, gender and equity balance, that the success of those entities is greater, that the contentment of the individuals involved is, in, is much improved. So this is really an issue for society at large. So women's responses were that there should be clear expectations about their roles and the path to advancement. They want to find an equitable and diverse workplace, and they wanna have access to opportunities for development and advancement. So this issue, again, is not unique to academic medicine. Women account for about half of law school grads and 36% of practicing lawyers. Uh, the proportion of managers in the US commercial banks uh, that were women was only about 35% about six, seven years ago. And the proportion of management in investment banking was even less than that. Um, so there are clearly lessons that we can learn from the business literature as well. But at, at, I think you would all agree with me that at some point we need to fix the system, right? It's not really about fixing the women um, to say that they need to uh, figure out how to get through this. I can remember um, as a fellow going to one of my academic society meetings and there was a, uh, a, a box lunch uh, sort of meeting of women in the field. And there were several women there who were in leadership positions. And this was, you know, like 20 years ago now, a little more than that. And their answer was basically like, yeah, you just got to figure it out. Just got to tough it out and figure out how to make it. Um, and we've learned a lot across many areas and many issues in our society. That's probably not going to be the most successful way to go. Um, so we need to make sure that tenure track positions um, are available for everyone um, and that everyone is considered, is encouraged to consider them. That doesn't mean everyone at large out there who's a physician should be seeking out a tenure track position, but they should be available if that's the path of work that they're moving towards. Uh, promotion, promotion and tenure timelines should really be very clear. Um, I don't know about you all, but I find that despite having outlines and checklists about the promotion pathway, that still is kind of a black box. 
Um, you put forth your dossier and it takes such a long time to ever figure out what's happening. You don't really know along the way. And that can be very disconcerting um, and be, uh, you know, chip away at your confidence as well. Um, but we also need to think about promotion tenure timelines that allow for flexibility. Obviously during COVID, we have made adjustments, most institutions have to allow for, uh, for lengthening the tenure clock. Um, we need to think about how to support women faculty to address things like self-efficacy and confidence, um, feelings of marginalization and isolation, and, and mentoring, which is something I'm going to focus uh, further in the talk. Um, we need to make sure we're encouraging women faculty to build relationship capital. This is a big deal. Um, networking, you know, I remember it when I was in medical school, everyone talked about then that you really should pick up golf or racquetball. I don't know who plays racquetball anymore, but that was the advice because that was what the business world said. That's how you got deals done. Um, it wasn't really in the meeting. It was after the meeting, right? It was uh, after hours at other, um, uh, other social engagements. And we really need to make sure we're encouraging people to take advantage of those opportunities. We also need to, though, provide structural support for development advancement. And I think Duke has actually been through the programs that Ann Brown has, has run through School of Medicine, as well as through the Office of Faculty Advancement on the campus. Um, has really done actually quite a good job when you compare that to other institutions for providing um, opportunities in that way. So I want to mention the ships, what I call the ships to success. And you may have heard this um, out there again in social media, talking about mentorship, sponsorship, and allyship. And I'm going to focus today a little bit just on mentorship and sponsorship, um, because those are the areas that I feel I have personal experience and expertise in. So, so what does mentorship mean, right? We hear that word thrown around a lot. Um, I think that we have done a very good job of figuring out mentorship in the research track, like in the career development path, in things that NIH, NSF, DOD have put forth. But I would argue that we have not done as good of a job, at least in a structured capacity, for mentorship and things outside the research track. How do you learn to be a leader in a division chief, department chair, dean role? How do you learn to be, um, how, where do you go to get information on how to get involved in the, uh, in the business aspects and budgeting of a service line um, across a healthcare system? We haven't put out yet adequate information, I think, to help people know how to choose those as pathways in academic medicine as well, because it isn't all about the research and the tenure and the professorship. It's really about figuring out what you want to do and how you want to get there. So mentorship, though, is about a personal development relationship. It is really about um, having a more experienced person or persons with that knowledge to help guide those who are um, less knowledgeable at the time. And true mentoring is more than just an occasional um, answering of questions or providing ad hoc help. It's really about an ongoing relationship of learning, dialogue, guidance, and challenge. So you should really be thinking, though, about how you choose mentors. There are some programs I know that set up automatic mentors, like you come in as a fellow or as a uh, junior faculty, and you're assigned a mentor. Um, that may be a good way if the mentors are really um, up to speed and take this on as a positive aspect of what they do. I personally find that um, choosing mentors is a little more organic for me, at least from the standpoint of being accessible. Uh, so mentors can be lifelong advocates, but they can also become adversaries. They can steer you to a perfect path or start you on a career ending path if their goals aren't really aligned with yours. They can help you to form good or bad habits, right? One of the things about mentors is sometimes they've been in the field for a long, long time. So they're not always thinking um, outside the box about how there might be new strategies to take on. And they can be very hard to leave and even harder to get over. And what I mean by that is many of you out there um, in the more seasoned uh, career levels, I would say, probably have stories, um, as I can tell as well, about what I call mentor breakups, right? Individuals that, um, that you know, you uh, found at some point were either disappointing um, or no longer held up on that pedestal that you put them on at one time. Um, and, you know, I like to talk a lot about mentoring because it has been a very um, positive and successful feature for my career. But the question is, is it absolutely necessary? 
many, many people out there have succeeded independently without a mentor or, or even after a bad mentoring experience. Um, and many people have failed despite having a great mentor or even a stellar mentoring experience. Some of that I think is because of um, mismatched expectations or not really uh, seizing the moment of what they wanted to do versus following the path of guidance. Um, and, but there are also many kinds of mentoring. Everything doesn't have to be like you're assigned a mentor, mentee, and that's it. Um, that's the classic mentoring pathway. There's also peer mentoring, there's self-mentoring, and there's what you get just from absorbing the culture around you. So uh, there's also good data about mentoring and its successes. So again, I wouldn't argue that you have to have one, but as someone who is uh, fairly research focused, I like to follow the data. And the data su that suggests that, that reciprocity and mutual respect, the clear expectations and connections and shared values have pushed forward um, individuals who have had uh, mentorship um, more, more advanced than others. Um, the value is that there's usually greater productivity. There is uh, definitely documentation and more rapid promotion, as well as academic retention. Um, there also can be failures though, from the standpoint of poor, poor communication, a lack of commitment, personality differences, any competition um, that's appeared, or a lack of experience in that way. So again, I, I would like to motivate you that why should you bother about thinking about mentoring? Well, mentoring facilitates career advancement and productivity. It's very clear. It serves as a catalyst for success. There's data to support that, particularly in academia. And mentees um, really can then do better with allocating their time um, for research, writing more papers, getting more grants if you're in the research space, um, so that they know when they have the appropriate guidance. Um, and lack of mentorship has been listed as a specific barrier to many individuals out there from the standpoint of achieving publications, completing projects, and so forth. So as I mentioned before, there are multiple types of mentoring, but there are also multiple mentoring roles, right? So I think of myself, uh, I mentor individuals on K grants, but I also serve on other K um, recipient or other trainees committees for that standpoint, because then you have um, Mentors from the standpoint of process, you have mentors who can guide you on content, uh, peer mentors I mentioned before. Uh, I get tired of that work-life balance uh, phrase, so I like to call it work-life integration. Not sure if any of us have mastered it, but nonetheless, um, it's good to have mentors to follow and see how they've done it. And also to think about outside mentors. I'm a big proponent of this, and I'm going to uh, show you some of mine. I think it helps to give you a break from what I call your home means that you can talk a little bit about what's going on around you. They don't have the same viewpoint that you do because they're not in it. They're not in the feeling the same pressures that you are, but they've potentially been through the same types of, types of experience as well. So <clears throat> I think that it's really very straightforward um, from the standpoint of comparing education and training years to say then your later career years as a faculty member. Um, there's sort of an obligatory relationship, right, between professors and attending physicians during um, the school and residency training program. There is relationships that often begin out of respect and admiration and mutual interest. And formally mentoring um, follows either by chance or del deliberate development. So a pursuit of a specific career path is often influenced by your environment or your culture in that training period. And so from my standpoint, um, I like to just mention a few people along the way for myself. So Dr. Philip Heine, who I know that uh, Sujata and Barbara, um, as well as uh, Dr. Bowie um, would remember well, and uh, Philip left just a couple of years ago to take on a chair role at Wake Forest. Uh, but he was my uh, first mentor, is what I would say, in the path of OBGYN and moving on to my career. He was one of my faculty members um, at University of Pittsburgh when I was there for residency. He was a clinician scientist in maternal fetal medicine and infectious disease fellowship trained as well. Um, he was my designated research mentor as a resident. I had my first, um, first author publication with him. Um, and he recruited me then to come here when he came uh, to take the division chief position in maternal fetal medicine. Um, the environment at McGee Women's Hospital, or what, what is now referred to as UPMC, um, was top notch. Uh, it was, it was and is one of the top 10 US OBGYN residency programs. 
We had over 10,000 uh, deliveries a year. It was a field day for anyone interested in internal fetal medicine, um, getting exposure and culture. But it was also a top 10 NIH research funded institution, including what was called the MFM Research Network that was an NIH funded network that I later um, was able to become a PI on and bring to Duke as well. But that really inspired me to want to, um, I would say, not only be guided by the things that Dr. Heine um, taught me, but he was someone who I really looked to want to emulate. I really, uh, you know, as a kid say, I want to be like him. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to follow in those fields. I wanted to be uh, a researcher who was well-funded and well-respected. So I think mentors during your early career um, may be more important um, than even during your training period. Um, it's a relationship that should involve either a shared discipline, a shared interest, or a methodology. And your first task, though, when you're in your early career is now you're really at a point you're probably choosing um, mentors for yourselves. But I would argue that you want to know for yourself first who you are. What are your own strengths and weaknesses? What are your short and long-term goals? Remember goals, they are not written in cement. You can rewrite them over and over again, but until you put them on paper, it's really hard to articulate them sometimes. Um, and also know what you don't know about a field or about academic medicine, about education or research. One of my mentees the other day um, started telling me she's gonna apply for an R21 in the summer. And she told me, well, I set up a call with NIH and I have this, um, they're gonna help me to set up my account so I can apply. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing? <laughs> we do all of that for you at Duke. This is our institutional responsibility. And so I thought, yeah, I need to remember to tell people to figure out what they don't know and ask rather than go down a path to figure it out themselves. So then if you're trying to figure out mentor and mentee matchups, do your homework. Um, if you're uh, looking, and I put this in both directions. Um, this is something I personally do when I'm interviewing, um, as I say, interview, say, um, uh, third year medical students looking for a research mentor. Um, you know, what is their uh, track record? Uh, do mentors, mentees have a publication record? Do their papers and their work build on a theme? Um, and that does not necessarily mean that these are right or wrong answers. Uh, when I say things about build on a theme, does it look scattered, right? That they have four or five different areas that they published in. That may be fine for trainees, right? Who are working with, uh, with different people along the way. But once you're say five, six years into your career, um, what does that mean about being, uh, are, are you still a research focused individual or are you really dispersing out into the other areas of academia? Um, has publication track record been steady and continuing? Um, and are you enjoying what, reading what they've done? Um, it may be hard, it may be hard to understand, but does it motivate you? Do you find that to be energizing? Um, and also to think about um, research and training along the way. So what are common mistakes when trying to approach possible mentors? So there's often this fear of rejection to say, well, I'm not good enough. You know, how many, how many people um, out there uh, can you know, always work with the top leading individual, but at the same time, if you don't ask, you're, it's automatically no. Um, there's a fear of competition with other trainees um, when you have, say, two individuals at the same level who want to work with the same mentor. Um, you may be influenced or forced to choose only from certain mentors. Um, you might decide too quickly. Um, you might also be sort of awestruck or captivated, like, wow, I want to work with so-and-so who's a Nobel Prize winner. Um, do you, do you just, are you just sort of captivated by what they've accomplished? Do you know who that person is and what she or he has done? Um, and, you know, looking for this sort of brand status is not necessarily the right um, motivation to looking for mentorship. So how do you get started? You want to be proactive. You want to take ownership of your career in the pursuit of mentors, and you want to know your mission, your values, right, your vision. Um, also build a committee of mentors. And, and uh, in addition to that, I often suggest you build a committee of your no committee as well, um, who can help you to decide which things to take advantage of and not. So moving on to my early career, um, Trules Ospi is a faculty member here in community and family medicine um, as an epidemiologist and clinical researcher. And I got connected with Trules early on because I knew I wanted to do intervention trials. Um, at that time, I thought focused on prematurity and infectious disease. And Trules um, has an outstanding track record for conducting interventional trials in pregnant women and postpartum women, not necessarily in the same field that I wanted to do, but certainly in the same 
um, pathway from, from the standpoint of protocol of development, research development, and grant development, um, and also research implementation. It sounds like not a big deal, right, to uh, design a randomized control trial. You just put people into one of two groups randomly and then move it forward. But how do you conduct study visits? How do you collect data? How do you train individuals to work for you? How do you trust them with the information? How do you follow it on a regular basis? Um, so I was fortunate enough to work with him on uh, several randomized controlled trials and also um, with his uh, Norwegian background, had a connection to the uh, Norwegian um, public health industry, and I was able to get access and work with him collectively and collaborated with others in Norway to get to my first, first, first author publication in JAMA. Um, that was focused on prematurity and the long-term impacts over life um, if you yourself are born preterm. But I'm happy to say that we've been able to continue our relationship as not only collaborators, but co-mentors now for other individuals who are interested in uh, similar pathways. In addition to that, I uh, always want to credit uh, Dr. Marilyn Miranda. She is now the uh, provost at Notre Dame, uh, previously the provost at Rice University, was a faculty member here in the Nicholas School of the Environment. And so I think you'll notice that while I mentioned Phil Heine to start, both Trules and Mari Lynn are not within OBGYN, um, and they're actually not clinicians either. Um, Trules was trained, but not a practicing clinician here. Um, so Mari Lynn's expertise was in environmental justice and geospatial mapping, and I worked with her as a mentor in my um, initial K grant on the Birch uh, program here at Duke um, that allowed me to have protected time. I was able to develop um, uh, run, implement, and um, successfully publish out of a large cohort study of pregnant women in the Durham County area. Uh, one of the skills that I will forever credit her for was learning successful grant writing skills because, you know, there's all kinds of learning of writing um, along our career, excuse me, along our um, training pathway where uh, pushed to write these what I call awful personal statements um, I hope I never have to write one of those again. Um, then we're sort of moving to writing um, scientific papers, abstracts and papers, and then somehow we're supposed to know also how to write grants. And there are definitely skills to be learned all along the way. Um, so I would argue that the best mentors out there are not just guiding you on what to do. They're advisors, they're coaches, they're counselors and supporters all at the same time. Um, there are a lot of uh, aspects for those who are able to integrate their career and life together that you can learn from. And they ultimately uh, do represent, I think, individuals that you wish to emulate or would like to become. I'd like to mention Chip Walter, who is a faculty member here um, in the Department of Pediatrics and a leader in the Vaccine Institute. Um, I wrote my first grant um, as a PI with Chip um, uh, when I moved my work over into focusing on the infectious disease aspects into immunization in pregnancy and postpartum. You've probably seen Chip on the news lately because he is one of the people leading many of the efforts in our COVID vaccine trials. Um, but I've been fortunate to work with Chip for many years now. Um, and not only from that have reaped the benefits of research and grants and development, but also had the opportunity for invited memberships to work on various state and national committees. And at this point is where I would, uh, where I see, saw when I look back that I could see where I started to make a jump towards what we call regional and national recognition. And I've been fortunate to be able to work on many working groups related to maternal immunization or vaccines during pregnancy um, from the groups that you see here. So I want to just jump over really quickly to something that we call sponsorship. So this is a bit different than mentorship. And a sponsor is someone who will make you visible. They're willing to stick their neck out for you, right? Introduce you to key players, put your name forward for opportunities. In the old days, we really just called this networking. And now we're putting it into kind of a different, uh, a different framework. Um, and I mentioned before, women, um, for whatever reason, do not develop the same social capital as their male counterparts and are more frequently offered opportunities um, to sit on committees without, say, even financial gain or financial impact, or really understanding what the return on investment may be. So there is, though, um, overlap between mentorship and sponsorship, but I put this forward to kind of understand what are some of the key differences. So mentors guide you on how to develop your career, sponsors help you to advance it. Mentors think about your personal and professional development, 
while sponsors really think about focusing on, on career advancing opportunities. It's a difference between being transformative versus transactional between the mentorship and sponsorship. And usually mentors are longitudinal, long-term mentors, and sponsors may just be episodic um, interactions. And I would say that mentors are critical early in your career and sponsors are critical as you advance and go later into your career space. Um, Kathy Edwards is uh, someone who what I would call out as uh, started out as a mentor, but then clearly has become a sponsor for me. Um, and she is a pediatric infectious disease uh, specialist at Vanderbilt. Uh, she is uh, someone who I consider one of my uh, greatest assets in having an external mentor, not here um, in the thick of everything I do every day to be able to provide some perspective. And I will say other uh, key traits for finding uh, mentors and sponsors is finding other common ground. I am um, a particularly a morning person. I like to get up about five and go to bed about nine or 9.30. Doesn't do so well with my teenage kids, but, um, but it's the way I've always been. Um, and Kathy lives in, uh, in uh, you know, an hour behind in Tennessee. Um, and we often talk at uh, six in the morning when she's walking outside at five in the morning for an hour. So kindred spirits on certain things certainly help to motivate as well. Um, and then I think many of you probably know Amy Martha. Um, I know Barbara and Sujata certainly do, but I can uh, consider Amy certainly one of my early career mentors, um, but then someone who has become a peer mentor and a sponsor for sure. Amy left uh, Duke a few years ago as well to take on a chair role at UCSF. Um, she is uh, forever a mentor, a colleague, and a friend. Um, all of those, I think, are equally important. She's able to, uh, we each other are able to provide logistical guidance, serve as a sounding board for each other, think about collaborative efforts to strengthen our combined expertise, and even co-mentor other individuals. So I don't want to forget, though, about the importance of mentoring uh, women who are most proactive in making their accomplishments visible um, and advance further. They're more satisfied with their careers and have greater compensation growth than women who were less focused on calling attention to their success. It tends to be something um, of modesty and being more humble. Um, and there are ways to amplify yourself, have others sponsor and amplify you. So it's just an important thing to keep in mind. Um, just a few more points I wanna raise. Um, so goal setting is really important to clarify expectations. Um, this is across the board, and I hope that you all are um, seeing that while I'm focusing this on advancing women, that these are key, key points for everyone to be considering. How do we establish roles and responsibilities? How do we make sure we give appropriate credit for shared work? Um, how do we commit to work together um, to work in, an effort, in a way that effort and accountability and credit are appropriately um, addressed? How do we think about rules of confidentiality? Um, we need to think about protecting each other, whether there are um, information that we want to be kept confidential other than in specific situations that I've listed here and I think you all would acknowledge as well. Um, how do we gracefully decline advice? Um, so how do you say no? This is a big thing that people talk about a lot, but it's not an easy thing to do. Um, how do you think about the reasons in advance carefully and thinking about declining something? Um, you also don't need to immediately decide. Often asking for time to consider um, can help. Um, express gratitude followed by sort of objective reasons for declining. You know, can I, I can't do that. I can't really um, take that on. I can't do it right now, but maybe I could do it in the future. Or provide an acceptable alternative. It's like that classic thing when you get asked to review a paper, um, you say, they ask you, you say you can't do it, but can you suggest someone else to do that for them? Um, so some lessons learned, I would say for myself, are to think about both short and long-term planning. Communication is incredibly important. Make sure we're distributing the workload appropriately to men and women um, and all individuals across our units. Um, think about authorship, and that really should be probably called credit um, for work performed. And make sure you're also distinguishing your career as separate from your mentor. As mentors, we need to make sure we're helping those mentees to distinguish their careers independently as well. So how can we take action? Um, we need to encourage women faculty to consider tenure track if that is the right thing for them. Um, if they're working on an academic pathway to research, um, to teaching, education, so forth, and understand the requirements of tenure, then it shouldn't be a discouragement. Um, it should be a consideration and then provide the support that they need. Think about unconscious bias training, which I'm sure you all have taken part in through all the things we've been offering um, at, at the institution. 
policies that um, within the confines of our regulatory environment are family friendly. Duke has uh, been working with that. You know, the university has made some changes in that, and hopefully we will see some more things across um, the health system as well. Uh, make sure that you're assessing progress on a regular basis. Um, I think the uh, required annual faculty reviews that the School of Medicine put in place is helpful in that way, uh, but you can't just wait till 12 months at a time to, to think about where you are. And really to think about training faculty to effectively mentor individuals across genders. Um, focus on sponsoring women faculty. Find out right how faculty perceive the culture and climate of your department and institution. Empower everyone right to support, uh, mentor, and sponsor each other and make sure we're supporting women faculty in national professional development opportunities throughout their career life cycle as well, and work to have them share their knowledge and experiences. Um, I, I, can, I can tell you, uh, excuse me, firmly that um, people like Barbara, um, whether they knew it or not, were doing all of these things. Um, their presence, uh, their motivation, their encouragement, they're pushing you to high expectations, um, but with kindness, and with support along the way is what we need. So it's really a privilege to be able to speak to you and, um, and be a part of this uh, first session to honor Barbara as well. So thank you all. Thanks, Gita. That was, that was fantastic. Um, certainly an honor for our department to and for Dr. Hertzberg to host you as our first Barbara Hertzberg um, lecture. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Barbara, would you like to, to make a comment? Sure. Dr. Swami, thank you so much for your outstanding presentation on women in academic medicine. Having worked together with you over the years, I was very happy when I heard that you would be giving this year's lecture. Your presentation was wonderful and a very appropriate topic for the first annual lecture. I would also like to take a moment to give my thanks to those in the radiology department who were involved in creating the annual Women's Health Lectureship with special thanks to the radiology's women's group. I would also like to express my appreciation to Dr. Paulson. Finally, I thank my colleagues, fellows, presidents, and medical students that I've had the privilege of working with during my career at Duke. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Barbara. It it's, uh, it's 8.25, so we do have a, a couple minutes for any questions or comments from the audience, either a live question or comment or through, through the chat. Sure. Let me just make a quick comment. Uh, thank you, Gita. But thank you, Barbara Hertzberg and Mike Hertzberg. Nice to see you both. <laughs> um, Barbara and I go way back. Uh, I was a medical student here and I remember sitting in ultrasound in Duke South, which is near where my office is now. Dr. Bowie was teaching, Dr. Hertzberg was in the reading room and actually Barbara was doing more teaching than the quintessential teacher, Dr. Bowie. And that continued throughout her career. She's taught so many of us medical students, residents in particular, also faculty was a mentor of mine, particularly when I was a fellow and a junior faculty member and has been a friend for our careers going way back. And I will acknowledge the textbook. The textbook is one of those textbooks that's a classic in radiology, co-authored by Dr. Middleton as well, who we now have a connection with. Um, and so Barbara, it is just, I, I feel, uh, I feel delighted that we've got a uh, Dr. Hertzberg uh, annual lecture moving forward and so nice to see you. Thank you so much. Gita, I will ask a quick question uh, unless other one comes forward. Just um, mentorship of, um, of a young female professional, is there added value to being mentored by a, another woman? or could I effectively mentor um, yeah. a, a young woman in, in radiology? Yeah, so, um, so what I would say is that uh, there is no absolute uh, you know, guide. And there is data um, out there suggesting that uh, women 
appreciate the contributions from female mentors, but it, there is not data suggesting that one is more successful than the other. And what I think it becomes, um, it, uh, Charles, in that space is that, you know, it's very clear to me, um, and, you know, I, I put some of the, the photos I had there and plopped them into timelines in my career, but I was interacting with those individuals all along. Um, so it isn't as if you, you know, have one mentor for a few years and then another, right? And I don't think that any of us would say that we would identify with only one person who ever led us, right? So it becomes really, um, I think, about what you're mentoring them on, right? So if you're assigned as their mentor to really think about, you know, holistically overall and be kind of a touch point for things, I think it doesn't matter at all. I think if you're talking about the expertise that you have, how do we make sure they have the right fit? Um, so I think there's, a, and that's why I struggle with the assigned mentorship versus the organic kind of identify mentors, because I think the assignment, um, I got assigned mentors when I was a resident, they were nice people, and I still think of them fondly, but not people who I keep up with now versus the people that I identified and, and, and put forth. Um, I, I think that there's also got to be some acknowledgement that, you know, mentoring is tough as just one person as well. I mean, we're all busy, right? There's no credit anywhere um, on our effort for mentoring. Um, there's nothing where we can account for that in funds. Um, that's all where, uh, you know, Eric has to put a few percent for you somewhere in the department and it all falls into those things. And so we really have to be thinking, I think, in that kind of team approach um, for different people's roles and expertise to help contribute. Thank you. Yes. Ida, hi, this is Joseph. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on what you know or have observed about the pandemic's effects on careers. Yeah. Uh, you know, we read about how it has exacerbated existing disparities for gender, right. race, and so on. Uh, there's stopping the tenure clock, but is there more? Can you say more about that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Thank you. So, so you know, the data out there, I think the problem is... Um, it's not dissimilar to all the other data on COVID, right? It's changing every day, right? Every From every morning we open our news feeds and we find something new. And so my concerns are that we know already that it's, um, it's widened some of the disparity gaps, but the implications, right, on um, the outcomes and the accomplishments of a career don't happen within a 12-month pandemic, right? We're talking about the long-term impacts. And so I think uh, it's going to be important for there to be consideration of that from, say, NIH, NSF, others on um, early stage investigator definitions, um, career development programs, expanding out maybe the time frame for, say, a K or mid-career Ks, um, and those sorts of things. I do think that the tenure clock extension, while there was kind of an automatic, um, it's been very clear that there can be um, exceptions. And that's something I think, Joseph, that um, most people don't know. It's actually not, I don't mean like you just ask and they say yes, but it's not such an obstacle to request an extension of your tenure clock um, with adequate justification. I think where the repercussions um, are really going to be difficult to figure out is the impact on, um, on our children, to be honest as well. Um, not just the childcare issues that we've had from the adult perspective, but then the education of our children, their accomplishments. And I hate to say it, but I think women are going to um, express more guilt about that um, and express more feeling of responsibility. And so it just continues this vicious cycle. And I think that is where we really have to um, think in this mindset that this is a collective, these are collective societal issues. If we put this only on women to figure out, um, ultimately everyone is still remains unhappy. It's not just women. So I think Joseph, the, on the career path, we're gonna have to work very proactively um, and kind of reevaluate, I think every six to 12 months, what does the tenure clock um, sort of thing look like? What, is, what are we seeing in our, um, hit rate for, say, grant submissions? Are we seeing the disparity widen? Are we seeing the numbers decline? You know, those are things we can do centrally to look um, at those numbers across the school. And if we see issues, maybe we think about other support programs. You know, we have a lot of um, development programs out there, you know, that are more like um, structured programs. But what about offering grant development opportunities? You know, uh, cons consultation with someone who one-to-one -one will help you develop your grant because you don't have the time or that sort of thing. Um, so other think outside the box kind of things that we'll probably have to do. Great. 
Um, Hi, Chuck. This is Phil. Uh, yeah. Do I have just a second? Of course. Uh, I, I want to congratulate the, the department and in particular Barbara for this uh, honor that she's received. I think it's well deserved. She's a great radiologist and uh, as they frequently say, a better person even. Um, mm -hmm. And she's always been very helpful to me. And Gita, I really appreciate it, especially the last comment you just made about watching a, a more extended timeline. I think too frequently it is expected that changes that are made in the social arena should happen immediately. And they take time to see them develop. And I think that going forward, watching um, in a particular timely fashion, whatever that time interval is, is the way to assess the success. Duke obviously has had lots of success with um, uh, moving women forward into leadership positions. Whether or not that translates into uh, tenure tracked positions or grant development is something that I suspect needs to be seen. Sure. Thanks for that. So it's interesting, you know, um, the data out there show it takes us somewhere between 12 and 17 years to implement clinical guidelines, right, effectively. It's a, apparently about three to five years for to see um, significant measurable cultural change. So uh, if, you know, these are all things that we have to be continuing to work on, continue to talk about and continue to, um, to monitor and look at metrics and so forth. So. If I might just add a, um, a personal recollection, my wife, uh, trained as an attorney, was the third associate and partner in a firm of over 70 attorneys when she was appointed uh, an associateship back in the 70s. But before that, she was working at a law office in um, Oakland, California, and told the men who were the leadership there that she was planning on going back. She was working as a secretary there. And she told the men there that she was going to go to law school and wanted to know if they would have a job for her when she returned to the law firm with her law degree. And they said, yes, we'll have a job for you as a secretary. <laughs> that's what, I was afraid that was what you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's right. what yeah. happened. Yeah. But she she worked her way through, and hopefully things are a lot easier at this time. Thanks, thanks, Phil and Gita. Thanks so much, and uh, Barbara, congratulations, and 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 great to see you. Um, and everyone enjoyed the day. Thank you.